The House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. Joining us today is uh, an author. Um, her book is From Daylight to Madness, the hotel number one. And it's Jennifer Ann Gordon. Thank you for taking the time. Thanks so much for having me, Alan. So, Jennifer, um, where did it all start for you, other than your parents? Like, did you, like, you, 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 um, like, how did you decide to actually write a book? Um, that's a, that's a good question. So, I've always been kind of a scribbler. I've always, you know, in high school, I journaled. After that, I wrote poetry for years. And uh, and I always, like, had it in the, my, the back of my head that I wanted to write novels. But every time I sat down to try to write a novel, I would talk myself out of it. I would just, you know, say, oh, I can't do it. It's just, like, too massive. Uh, what else? Was it, was it, did, did you not have confidence? I didn't have confidence, you know. And I think a lot of writers uh, are, were very, we're artists, so we're insecure and I, I, yeah, I felt like I didn't, I didn't have the confidence enough that it would be good. I didn't have the confidence that I would be able to finish it. Uh, but, but then I finally did. I mean, when I, when I sat down to write my, my first book, which came out last year called Beautiful, Frightening and Silent, uh, I just started it kind of as an exercise. I thought maybe it'll be a short story or maybe it'll be a novella. And and the characters just kind of got a life of their own and, and a novel came out of it. Hmm. And I think that's even uh, the book From Daylight to Madness. When I sat down, I, I thought the same thing. I said, I have this story that I've been planning for years. I don't know if it's going to be a novel. Maybe it'll Maybe it'll be something shorter. And I think that takes some of the pressure off. And then, and then from daylight to madness turned into like this mass of work, uh, which is why it's now broken into two books instead of uh, just one very long one. That's why it's the hotel number one. Did you, so do you feel like you've gained confidence now? Like, are you at the point where you think, okay, I, I'm a writer? Um, yes. But I think, again, I, I, as an artist, as an artistic personality, there's always going to be that little lingering uh, question mark in the back of your head of, I think I'm a writer. Well, do other people think I'm a writer? Like, I like my book. I'm writing a book that I would want to read. Will other people want to read it? And I go back and forth like while I'm writing, thinking things like, you know, this is brilliant. I'm a genius. Uh, I'm going to win the Bram Stoker Award. And then the very next paragraph, I'm just like, how do I make a sentence? <laughs> Does this even make sense? Yeah. So I guess so when you get to that point, um, you feel like you're constantly growing then. Like each book will get better that you do. I, I, I think so. I, I really do. I mean, and I've had people who read my first novel who, who have now read uh, From Daylight to Madness, and they can already see the difference. And it's From Daylight to Madness was just my second novel. Uh, and my editor, who's working on the edits for The Hotel Part Two, uh, she sees a difference even from, from Daylight to Madness, which is they were all kind of written at the same time, but like she can see, you know, stylistic differences and like a clearer narrative voice yeah well, less that, less mistakes that's maybe, pretty hopefully. that's pretty yeah that, well that's natural that's natural i've been through i think i'm on book 16 and i think each book gets a little better because you get better at uh, being able to express what you want to right and so that's, and yeah yeah and and just like developing your voice like your your my voice as an author, your voice as an author. Like, it's it's interesting now, like, just having, you know, kind of finished my third book, having people 
say to me like, oh, I, I love the style that you write in. And I, I, I love that it's um, so lyrical. I love the poetry. I love the rhythm of your words. And it's interesting to me that other people can see that. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I, I have a style. And, oh, you got it. <laughs> yeah. well, you know, but I think it's really hard for any of us to recognize our own style. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's from, it's from outside in. So how does that affect you if someone gives you not a good review or someone doesn't like your stuff? Oh, um, you know, I'll be honest when I, I hate to say when I first started, because I'm still such a, a baby at all of this, but my, when my first book came out, I got um, a lot of good reviews and then I got a really bad review and I, I cried. I cried myself to sleep. <laughs> I, I, I felt like it was the end of the world. And I, I talked to my other writer friends, and one of them said, I want you to go to Amazon and look up your favorite books and read their bad reviews. So I did. Uh, you know, I went to Amazon. I looked up Haunting of Hill House by Shirley Jackson, and I, I read all the one-star reviews. Not all of them, but a bunch of them. Yeah. And people who, those reviews were saying things like, you know, oh, it was boring, it was it, it was confusing, this wasn't real horror, like, I hated her style, too overly descriptive. And it was all the things that I love about her books, people were saying they hated. So that made me feel better. Oh, good. Because, because, you know, my first bad re review, I remember it said something like, you know, it's sad, depressing, uh slow nothing happens but the end did tie it all together and i thought well at least that person read it all the way to the end so that was a positive to take yeah. out of it and and since then i've gotten you know uh, my fair share of not so great reviews i mean I, I, most of them are still very very positive but and i think the people who don't like the style of my writing like it, it is very lyrical it is there's a lot of like poetry infused in the language and it's not for everybody and no matter how good my book is if somebody doesn't want to read a, a gothic horror novel that is lyrical and uh poetic in nature they're not going to like my book like if they they just won't you know i've they're not going to like it if they don't want to read something that's kind of sad <laughs> right because and, cause I've, I've gotten reviews like that, too. They were like, oh, I, it was just depressing. I'm like, but, <laughs> I'm like, didn't you read the back of the book? I mean, it clearly is it's about like a woman who goes to a mental institution after she loses a baby. Of course, it's a little depressing. Kind of sounds like a party. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, well, I remember even way back uh, when I was pitching my first book, uh, I got an offer from a, a publishing house that I didn't take because but they said and I, I, like I, we loved it we loved everything about it we want to publish it except it needs a rewrite because your main character should be funnier he should he should be funny and in that book beautiful frightening and silent um it's about a, a man who's slowly going insane because he feels responsible for the death of his son and his wife and I'm like he, he was but he's not a funny character. Like, he's not going to be cracking jokes. He's having a nervous breakdown in a haunted house. And, like, and so I asked him, I was like, what parts are, am I supposed to, like, make funny? And they were like, well, just, like, give him a sense of humor. Make him maybe, like, sarcastic. And I, I said no, because then it wouldn't be my book anymore, and he wouldn't yeah. be my character that I loved so much. Yeah, well, and that's something you have to be careful of because, not only that, there's, uh, you know, I, 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 one of my books was made into a, a made-for-TV movie, and um, I didn't realize I was so excited that they wanted to sign me that I signed and flew down to LA and had a great time, and <laughs> and at the end of the day, they changed the whole thing, and uh, I, I got really kind of out of joint you know i kind of thought well yeah. this isn't this this isn't even close to the book it's like no no but we got to keep people on the edge of their seats we want to make sure they don't turn the channel it's like oh 
okay, so then why don't you just write your own story? I mean, it was... <laughs> but, Maybe they really liked your title. <laughs> well, but no, it was it was the title, it was who it was about, and it gave them uh, um, credibility. So that's kind of what they do. So yeah. if you've got if you've got like a true crime book and, and it's credible, and if it's part of what they're doing, and then all of a sudden it gives you that credibility, so people say, well, this has got to be pretty real. Yeah. Um, some of it is, but there's a lot that they just sort of throw in there, and uh, so you have to be very careful with that and with publishers because they will do things like that. But um, anyway, um, now when we get into your characters, um, how is it that you decide? your characters like where where do they come from is this total imagination is this something that you've met someone and you know them or you've seen them on the street where does it start um it so for me now this is this is probably going to sound like i'm a kook so but i'm just gonna i'm just gonna go with it uh for uh, from daylight to madness i'll talk about the characters in in that book because that is my new release they, uh, my two main characters, and, and again, this sounds weird, came to me because I was getting past life regression. I was being hypnotized. And I saw flashes very specifically of my main character, Isabel, flashes of her life and, and some of the experiences she had and a person she met. It, and it, and I became so fascinated whether this was my past life, if it was just my brain telling me a story. I wanted to know more about her, Isabel. And so I, I created a, a story for her. But, but she came to me in, under hypnosis, which sounds silly. So, but where, so where does that come from? No, that's uh, you know, I we we've got a, a medium that hosts our paranormal show, so I'm, I'm quite familiar with this. So, do you, do you have, um, I guess, how do I say it? Do you have a belief or an interest, or have you had experiences in the paranormal that makes this come to life for you? Um, yes, to all of those things. Uh, I am a I am a believer in the paranormal. I'm a I'm a believer in ghosts. I'm a believer in past lives, and uh, I'm a believer that places can hold the energy of things that may have happened there or people that may have lived there. And uh, I I've, I've had a lot of experiences with spirits. I've, you know, I've gone to a lot of haunted places, and I do feel them when they're when they're about. And uh, yeah, no. Oh. So but that, that's interesting. So when you have a character like uh, I believe it was Isabel, right? Yes. And Isabel comes to you when you're doing one of these uh, past life, or when you're doing kind of a hip, hypnosis or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so when that happens, and uh, you just you decide that you're going to write a book using her as a character. Did that put a sense of responsibility on how you wrote it? Yes, it did. Especially because, you know, the experiences I had during the past life regression, I felt so connected to her because obviously it was past life regression. So she's part of me. And even though this book is fiction, uh, the very, very first scene, my prologue it is, is what I experienced in the past life regression. So that sort of came to me fully formed. Uh, I just had to, to write it. I had to make it uh, art instead of a memory. So she, she, she came to me like that. And, and then I just, I created a world around her. I, I took that experience that I believe she had and and that was the, the catalyst for, you know, a, a horror novel, <laughs> as it turns out. You know, when I because when I had the past life regression, it was years and years and years ago, and I always thought I'm going to write her story, and I thought I was going to write historical fiction, and and I think 
that was one of the reasons why I didn't write that book for so long, because I kept thinking, no, it's just, it's going to just be literature. It's just going to be the story of this woman's life. And once I realized that I could do both, I could have it be historical fiction, and I could have it be, a, you know, a creepy, gothic, uh, haunting, then that made me feel better. So I had a responsibility to her, but also the imagination to, uh, you know, create a world for her that wasn't real. So do, do you still feel a connection to, to Isabel? And have you had experiences since then? Um, I have. I have. I, so I do feel very connected to her. Um, she was a, really, really real to me. Um, I, all my characters are very real in my head. <laughs> and sometimes they do things that I don't expect them to do, and then I, I yell at them. But, uh, yeah, I am I am connected to her. But I'm, but I'm also really connected to my completely fictional characters, too. I, I think I, as a writer, I spend a lot of time building the character, um, even just in my head. I, I know everything about them. Uh, I went to school for theater, so one of uh, our, the major things that we would always work on is character development. We would, you know, film whole notebooks about a character that we were playing. Even if none of that made it to the stage, we had to know them. We had to know everything about them. So I feel like I, I do that with the characters I write. Well, where do those supporting characters come from for you? Uh, again, back to the earlier question. So, because Isabel came to you in an experience, but with the other characters, the supporting characters in the book, um, how how did you create them? Are, are you that person that sits in the coffee shop and watches people and, and pick things up? Oh, um, you know, I'm not. I'm really not. Uh, I, I used to, again, like in school for theater, we like that would be some of our assignments is go and watch people. But now, I don't know, I think they just kind of pop out of my head. But they're also, I won't lie, some of them are like amalgamations of people I know. Right. You know, like a little bit of, you know, the ex-husband mixed with, uh, you know. <laughs> yeah. A bad ex-boss, you know, like something crazy, and then voila, villain. Yeah, yeah, but you, so do you take people that you've kind of known, let's say you take an ex-boss and an ex-boyfriend or husband or whatever, and they're both kind of turned out bad for you, and so you take kind of their bad things and make a character that's pretty evil, but do you do, you do that on purpose to have some sort of retribution, do you think? Do you kill them off? Um, <laughs> I'm not going to comment on the killing off, uh, because there, there would be spoilers for, for all of my books. Right. Um, I do it, I think a little bit, it is therapy. It is therapy to, to kind of exercise your demons. I know in my, in my first novel, Beautiful, Frightening and Silent, uh, it, it involves a, a like, um, an assault that it involves an abusive situation, a woman being in an abusive uh, relationship. So to me, that that helped me get over my past abusive relationship uh, in writing it. And even though, again, it was a horror novel, so it, you know it doesn't end well for anybody usually. Yeah. <laughs> it's not the happily ever after. I know. And so it's funny. I when I when my advanced reader copies went out for from Daylight to Madness and I was getting um, some early reviews, people were saying, "Oh, I really my main characters Isabel and Francis. I really hope it works out for them. Like I hope they get their happily ever after." And I just I felt so bad because it, it's it's not a romance. So yeah, you know, and I <laughs> so things. You know, they tend to not go as smoothly <laughs> no, <laughs> when, no. when you're, you're both patients in a Victorian uh, mental institution. Like, <laughs> there's not a lot of 
chance for a good <laughs> good riding off into the sunset together. <laughs> Not a lot of warmth there. <laughs> I know. Uh, well, so what made you go to horror? Like, what was it that triggered you into writing, you know, frightening sh yeah. stories? Um, I've always been a, a huge horror fan since I was a kid. Uh, I, I read my first Stephen King at the age of 10, and I haven't looked back since. So it's it's my go-to genre for for everything, for movies, for TV. Uh, and I like all kinds of horror, like 80s slasher flicks to um, the weird Japanese moody uh, new horror movies. I like it all. Uh, so, and as a writer, I think I like... I want to write something that I would want to read. And <clears throat> my favorite types of books in the horror genre are gothic horror. Um, I love slow-burning, unsettling, creepy buildings. Uh, you know, like, I like the idea that you can walk into a room, and though it seems nice... Like, you can tell, like, there, it looks like there's, like, faces in the wall. Like, I just love that kind of horror, like a subtle uh, unease, a pleasurable terror, if you will. And that's, so that's what I, hmm. I like to write. So, so when you, uh, when you write a story, uh, what's the most important element? Do you think it's the... Um the literature, or do you think it's the story, the character? What What do you find? Um, I think for me, it's the character. It's the character's emotional journey. I I think that's the most important part for me. And that's even when I'm reading, because I read a lot, uh, the character. I don't even need to like the character, but I do need to believe that that character is real so yeah it's, it's interesting so when you um let's say um things that you're going through in life and even things in the world so um for instance this year so you, you know you're you're finishing this book you're writing this book and when when dark things happen in the world so you know you've got uh riots and you've got protests and you've got COVID and you have all sorts of things going on around you. Uh, though you're writing an older book, of course, so it's not going to have that in it, but does that seep into the way you write? Does it become darker? Um, I, it, it does. I, I really think it, it does. There's, um, I wrote a lot of these, I wrote a lot of um, From Daylight to Madness in the very early stages of the quarantine when nobody knew what the heck was going to happen when it was still freezing outside and it was dark early and we weren't leaving our house for months. And so I think some of that like isolation crept into my characters. It crept into their world. There was a kind of a frightening loneliness about it. And and the other thing that I found was, uh, with From Daylight to Madness, it takes place in 1873. So, you know, we're years after the Civil War, but there's still like this, like, ache in the country. Like the, and I mention it a few times in, in the book. And, and I think, we're kind of going through that now because it's like very rarely does the world or even the whole country experience something together. And it, it kind of scars, scars the country. It scars our world. And, and I think there's, there's a similar feeling, a similar, uh, you know, existential angst that, that happens after any kind of major tragedy and I was feeling that, and I'm still feeling that now because of everything that's happening uh, here in, in, 19, in 2020. And I think my characters were feeling that when I was writing about them. But their scar, their big earth-shattering emotional thing 
was the war, but the pain is still the same. The fear is still the same of what if, what if it gets bad again? It always does eventually, but. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, there's always a setback to, so, um, that's um, so. When you do something like this, it must take a lot of research to fill in the time space. Like to be eighteen in the eighteen seventies, you must have to go yes. back and make sure that your characters speak the way they're supposed to. The way, you know. yeah. You, um, I I tried not to have the language be so stilted that it would be unreadable, but it was a lot of research. Um, most of the book takes place on an island, so there was just, like, a lot of things. I did a lot of research on some specific islands that um, are off the coast of New England where I live to, to understand just, like, everything about it, everything, like, how far you could dig a hole on a rocky island, specifically, a, a very specific island I'm thinking about. And, and the research of all the little things that takes up so much time. Like, what are, what were they using for lights? What were their shoes like? What is, you know, <laughs> yeah. the weirdest things. Like, I was trying to describe um, chairs on a porch, and I would call them Adirondack chairs. And I'm like, oh, when were Adirondack chairs invented? <laughs> they weren't invented in 1873. Uh, you know, so, like, the little things like that, they add up. Like, oh, no, oh, I'm... Yeah. I, I was like, I'm, they, I wanted people to go into, like, a restaurant. But the word restaurant wasn't popularly used in the United States until the 1930s. Right. So I'm like, oh, gosh, what, I, <laughs> what do I call this random place of eating then? <laughs> you mean there was no McDonald's drive through <laughs> <laughs> No, but that, that's important. But I guess a lot of times when I read or if I'm watching a um, – a story about something happening a long time ago, like in the 1800s. Um, it really, it really throws me when their speech is so 2020. Right. You know, I like, mean, my... oh, sorry for your loss. And it's like, what? what? No, <laughs> you, you I know, didn't say that. yeah, yeah. Just, yeah. That, that, but that, that will throw my mind off of the story that, that, so it's very important. I think people really do the research. Yeah, you have to. You have to. Um, you know, my books take place in, uh, like, this little island off the coast of Portland, Maine. And just, like, figuring out who was living there at that time. Like, what was the demographic of people? Who, who was staffing hotels, quote-unquote hotels, that were really just places for a rescuer? Like, who was working there? Um, and, you know, so I did a lot of work. I had a, a genealogist help me, and she did great, outstanding research on old Victorian era island hotels of New England and and what the staff was like. And it was the majority of people that worked there were young Irish girls. Mm. So, and I, I never would have known that. I did research on um, like an almshouse, a poor house to figure out, you know, who was there, what was killing people, why were there orphans, okay. And, you know, there was a Spanish influenza outbreak. So, because you just have to, like, figure out where your character is now and, like, and then backtrack it. Like, okay, she's 36 now, so that means when she was a child, this is what was going on. So every time she would have a memory of her childhood... I had to know about that time period too. Yeah, no, it's, it, but that makes the story. That makes it complete. It makes it authentic. You know, like you said, you, you can, I, I love historical fiction, but I have a hard time watching a lot of historical fiction TV shows because they are so bad yeah. with, like, specifically the clothing. Sometimes yeah. I'm like. What is she? She's wearing a prom dress. She wouldn't have bare shoulders. Yeah. You know? No, I know. Then, but that I don't think. Well, I think because of the way things are streamed now, I think a lot of these um, streaming networks 
are under pressure to do a lot of shows. So I think there's a lot of formulated writing. Yeah. So, so people just kind of formulate it, put it together, and get it out there. And this, they don't pay attention to the detail, you know. Yeah. And, yeah. and that, that throws people if they have any idea of what it was really like. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. So now, besides the story and the characters, when someone – so I pick up from Daylight to Madness, and I bring it home, and I read it. Is there something you want me to take away from that book other than the story and the characters? Oh, um. Like, is there a message underlying? Is there a theme? Is there something that you want to get across to people, uh, even about your characters, but in a, in a way of it represents to a group of people or um, something else, a, a certain statement? Um, I think... I mean, and this might sound like strange because it is a horror novel. Um, I would want people to take away from my book that there are moments in your life that are so beautiful and so fleeting, but you can't forget them. And you can't let the rest of the terror around you make those fade away. And you should try whatever you do to hold on to the, the, the glimmering, brief moments of happiness uh, as much as you can. Really. Yeah, that's, yeah, it's true. It goes fast, you know. It goes fast, you know. And, and especially when you're writing, like, darker, darker fiction, like horror or even, like, thrillers, psychological suspense, uh, time moves fast. And terrible things happen to me. You know, we put our characters through hell. <laughs> and, uh, and I do feel bad for doing that, but they have had, they have had some happiness. There are moments. Yeah, right. You're a torturer. Yeah. Um. Uh, I, I do. I, I, you know, sometimes I really feel bad. I'm like, oh, gosh, these poor people. Oh, well. <laughs> yeah, well, Max. No, are you are you personal then with your characters? Like some of the fiction writers I've talked to uh, have described their characters as their children, or um, you know they're very important to them. And uh, do you find that yourself? Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, so my first novel, Beautiful, Frightening, and Silent. My main character, his name's Adam, and I. I keep telling people, I'm like, I'm still not over him. He broke my heart. Writing him broke my heart. Um, and, like, part of me loved him. You know, even my fiancé is like, oh, I think you're in love with your character. <laughs> like, <laughs> I think I am too. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, yeah, and I think I think as a writer that means I'm, to me, I'm doing a, a good job. If, if there's a character that I don't care about at all, then I'm not doing my job as a writer. Because if I don't love my characters, even love to hate them, I can't expect anybody else to. And, uh, yeah, so, and Isabel and Francis from, uh, from Daylight to Madness, there were scenes that I wrote for both of them that, I just, I felt it in my heart so much that, like, tears were streaming down my face. Like, I felt all of their emotions. So I don't really think of them as my children, but I do think of them as kind of part of me. Yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of what I get. Um, I've never done fiction, so I I have no idea myself. Um, I couldn't imagine. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it's it is really weird. It is you know, and especially so I I'm a pantser, I'm not a plotter, so I I kind of know the beginning, middle and end of my books going in, but I don't really know how I'm gonna get there. And sometimes they really do have like a life of their own. They do things, your characters, even though I'm typing it and I, I'll scream at the computer, that was the wrong decision. <laughs> <laughs> like you did the wrong thing you're going to ruin your whole life now <laughs> and then I just keep typing I'm like oh yeah wow 
that, <laughs> that's such a different experience than what I go through. So that's 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 really fascinating, you know. Um, wow. Now, what does Jennifer do um, when she's got a block? When you're when you when it's just not coming together, you, you're having a struggle. You can't get the story out. Is there something you do or go to to try and break that? Uh, bourbon. <laughs> no, uh, alcohol. Um, no, I, I, I haven't really had writer's block. I've had things where I, I, I feel like it's like not flowing, and if it's not flowing, I give myself permission to to walk away from it for a couple days, a day. Um, I'll do, I, you know, either research or. I do a lot of, uh, I make a lot of, like, promotional images for my books and stuff. So I'll look through photos, stock photos, and, you know, trying to find things that, that fit the feeling of my book. And sometimes that, like, I'll just see an image and go, oh, I'm unblocked. I feel it now. Like, scrolling through hundreds and hundreds of photos, and then you see somebody that is exactly who your character is. And you go, that's incredible. And just like the way they're standing or the way their eyes are moving. And then you, uh, to me, I just, it invigorates me all over again. So, so being a horror fan and being a horror author, um, how do you find modern day horrors compared to something, let's say, 100 years ago, or even in the 30s and 40s, like the Frankenstein, Dracula, and all that stuff, the originals like that, compared to what comes out now. Of, co of course, nowadays, there's in movies, there's, they've got so much better technique and more money and all that stuff, right? But, but the, story, the, the stories themselves, do you find modern-day horror stories to be as original or as good, or how would you describe them? Um... You know, I think there's a trend, um, a good trend right now that, like, it doesn't have a name, but I always call it smart horror. Like the the new Haunting of Hill House series from Netflix, uh, movies like The Little Stranger, uh, TV shows like Dark, um, where, it, or, or movies like Hereditary, things like that, uh, that that are taking horror to a new level, making it more emotional, more real. And again, I think they're, you're getting really great actors now who are willing to star in horror films, whereas even back in the 80s and the 70s, the horror films were like, you know, B-list, no-name <laughs> actors. Like, it, it, they would just, you know, hire nobody's paying five thousand dollars they you know get chased around the summer camp by somebody with an axe and uh the end i like those movies but i think i think there's a more intellectualized horror now like and i think that the thing that you brought up earlier about like all these streaming services and we have access to everything now we can watch all the old horror movies like we're like desensitized in many ways for to horror and i mean because the world is horrifying <laughs> so i think the things that are happening now in horror films they're they're it, instead of just like making us scared and our hearts pounding they're also making us think and weirdly like almost like worry and care uh so I like what's happening in horror now. It's even it's happening in horror novels as well, um, and I think there's a lot more female horror writers that are that are in the genre right now and that are getting some good attention. But what does that bring? Like what what? So how do you distinguish between a female and a male as in horror? I you know as this isn't my category. So is there a different type of writing that comes from a female or let's say a feminine? person as compared you know, to a masculine i don't think the writing is different i think the respect is different now and i think uh you know I, i've 
I've been going to like horror conventions for years and it's, it's, it's a very male dominated genre right. for the people who are at the convention to, you know, the actors they chose to be there. It was predominantly men. And, and I think my, my whole life, every time somebody says like, Oh, well, what are you into? Like what kind of movies, blah, blah, blah. And I always say, I mean, I'm into horror. And they, they're always shocked, like not so much anymore, but they used to be like, oh, but that's like for guys or that's, you know, or you seem so f- like happy and friendly. <laughs> and I'm like, you think that just because I love horror and I'm obsessed with true crime podcasts and <laughs> that I should be like, you know, mean. Well, that's when you tell happy. them you've got two bodies in the trunk. So Yeah. <laughs> and there's room for a third. There's room for more. <laughs> yeah. But, um, well, I just, I find that interesting how you, when you bring that up. I just wondered if they had a, if, 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 do you think you take a different angle to how you write a story about a horror or some sort of haunting as compared to maybe a male? Um, You know, I I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, maybe, I mean, there's obviously experiences that I've had being um, a woman that that I bring to, to my stories. But, well, I, I mean, I, but I, that's to be said for a man, too. Like, there's, you know, the male experience is something that, even yeah. though I write, I tend to write about male lead characters, um, and I, I sort of prefer writing men. Yeah. But. Well, when I say that coming from even a true crime nonfiction way, um, I, I find there is a difference with female writers. Like Anne Rule would 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 attack a murder much different than um, Truman Capote, let's say. Right. Do you know, there's a different. They they focus on different things, and that might not just. It, in the old times, it was probably male, female because of the roles we played. Nowadays, our roles are more equal and more the same, so maybe there's less difference. Yeah, I, you know, I think so. I th- because, yeah, to me, I don't really notice. I only notice it's like a, a, a male perspective, quote-unquote, or a female perspective. Um, we'll say a male perspective. I only notice it when it's something where, like, they're just describing a woman, right. and it's, like, so overtly sexual for no <laughs> exactly. reason. Yeah. Like, for yeah. no reason at all. It's not a – it's not. It's like, you know, like, Barbara was making coffee in the office. Her breasts yeah. tight, blah, blah, you know, like, all this <laughs> stuff. And I'm like, why? Yeah. What? Yeah. Why is this even happening? <laughs> right. And I think that's sort of what I mean. So in a horror, you're always – you know, like a lot of the old style horrors, you know, there was a lot of females that were the focus of the ones being terrified and killed or, yeah. you know, uh, attacked. It wasn't, you You weren't getting psycho with a man in the shower, right? Exactly. That, you know, so I just wondered that because uh, it, in true crime, it's changed. The attacks are much the same nowadays, but years ago, it was very distinct. You could tell the difference. Do you think, um, so... In true crime, uh, like, were the female authors, uh, do you think they, fa- I don't, I don't want to say favored the victims more, but I, I always felt like there was more of a focus on the victims. Well, not so much that there was more, but they had more emotional ties. Yeah. So, so a female writer like Anne Rule could talk about how it was, what it was like to be, loved by a killer or being beside someone and and talk about it in a in a emotional sensual way where is a, a man in general especially in the old days for sure didn't write it that way do you know you know what i'm saying they wouldn't yeah, explain no, it as if you know to them it would be a different thing when they if they were sleeping with a serial killer and found out they would talk about it in a different light it's not so um emotional or sensual right it, and you're right it would be more sexual and more um 
aggressive. Yeah, more aggressive. So, you know, uh, so there was a difference. I think nowadays I don't find as much of that. I think that it's, it's more kind of across the lines now. I don't see so much of that. But um, So I was just wondering, because even, like I said, you look at the old horrors, even, you know, the Vincent Price and all those, and even Psycho, it was always aimed at a female, and it was yeah. written from a male perspective. So it was terrifying that way. But, you know, so so what I'm saying is, do you think a female writer who wrote, if they were to write something like Psycho, would it come out the same? Yeah, you know... You know, I, yeah, you know, it's it's really interesting because so like I'm I'm like racking my brain, and yeah. because I, you're like traditional quote unquote traditional horror, it was always a woman running through the woods screaming, a woman right. you yeah. know fleeing a house, and in the in the two books that I have out so far, um, in both in in everything I've written right now, the like in my first book, Beautiful, Frightening, and Silent, it's a story of a man being haunted and petrified. And the person doing the haunting is a woman. She's like this. So it's a female ghost right. um, and, a, and a petrified man. <laughs> and uh, But that's more and acceptable even, now. You can yeah. do that now and people, it's more believable, it's more acceptable. If you did that in 1960, people would kind of think, oh, it's ridiculous. Yeah. You yeah. No, I mean? they would. Yeah, men aren't like that. What are you talking about? You know, it was it's an awkward situation. Um, I just I just think that it's good. I think that's a better thing because now people have more expression. You know. Yeah, I know. I've had a lot of people, um, like you know, since I've been doing interviews and stuff, they've like come right out and asked me. They're like, "Is it hard to write, um, like from the point of view of a man?" And I'm like, "You would never ask a male author. Oh, is it hard to write a woman?" Yeah. You, no, you don't ask that. And I was like, no, because my characters are just having human experiences. Right. I haven't written anything from a man's point of view that I, I don't understand because I'm writing about human experiences. I'm writing about emotion. Um, yeah. Well, there's a cor correctness now going on, right, you know, as usual. But, uh, you know, with the thing about even, you know, can a straight actor play a gay character and can a, right. you know, there's all of that stuff going on. And I think that it's kind of a little out of hand. I think that that's why you are an actor. You are acting. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> you know, you're, right, you're, you're doing that job. It doesn't matter. And, and the more we try to define our characters by their sexuality or by their color or, or whatever it, it, it you kind of lose some of the humanity in it right you know. and you know and so so in from daylight to madness uh my character isabel uh so this is not really a spoiler but somebody asks her and she's married to a man they ask her if she, if she's ever really been in love and she says Yes, I was in love with a girl. Her name was Molly. And I had somebody read it, and they're like, oh, my gosh, there you're writing like an LGBTQ horror <laughs> novel. And I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm just writing a horror novel. And they're like, oh, but she's pansexual or bisexual. And I'm like, she, yes, probably, but in her heart, she didn't even – there was no words for that for her. Like, right. she wasn't having a – a, a gay experience it was an experience of love right. so and back um, then they i don't think they you wouldn't you know in 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 18 1700s any of those days you wouldn't sit there and if you had an attraction you weren't be think you wouldn't be thinking oh maybe we could get together and live together buy a right. horse and two dogs and buy, know. you know that's exactly just, there was no such thing as developing a relationship you know, uh, it, so this it totally wouldn't be on their mind. Yeah. yeah, like she didn't, and like, so when I was like exploring this with her character, it's like at that moment that she says Molly's name, I think, truthfully, that's the first time she even admitted it to herself. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. I guess I, I guess I was in love once. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of crazy, uh, it, but that's great. I think that that brings up an experience of someone a long time ago and how they would have felt about such feelings right. as compared to now. Because now if, if you were writing a character in, in 2020, she would probably be open to the idea 
Yes. Like, yeah, know. because, so like the whole thing in um, From Daylight to Madness, it's like one very brief scene, and it's a memory she has of like, you know, Molly, her the, the girl she was in love with, kissing her very briefly while Isabel was sleeping. Or, but Isabel wasn't asleep, but she was too scared to open her eyes. And that was, like, the big thing. She was just like, what would have happened if I had opened my eyes and allowed myself to love this person? But it was, like, not even an option for her. She didn't even understand that she could do that. Right. There was no no concept of developing a relationship, moving yeah. in together, getting married, or any of that stuff. We'll adopt children, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know, it's, yeah, especially, I mean, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, no. They, they just couldn't do it. Couldn't well, do it. it, it you know, I, you don't know, it, it's not a focus, but it was still against the law. It was yeah. illegal, so, I mean, it, it was more attention on the male-male relationships, but, yes. but it was definitely not, um, you know, legal. So, yeah, that's, I think it's all interesting. I think it's great, and you're doing great work. Now, do you have, um, do you have a, a place that you would like people to come find your work? Do you have a website? Do you have, like, a blog or what? I do. I have um, my website is jenniferangordon.com, and that's Anne with an E, like Anne of Green Cables. <laughs> uh, so jenniferangordon.com. That has kind of everything on there. It has my books. It has um, – I dabble in art and photography, so that's on there, too. A link to my podcast, Fox Vomitists, uh, is there as well. So that's kind of the be-all, end-all, uh, jenniferangordon.com. You can get all my Instagram links and my Facebook links and everything are there Fantastic. as well. And, Great. Uh, well, yeah. well, we'll put that on our website, and we'll put your book up there so people Thank can you. unclick when they listen, and uh, then they can find you, and they can, uh, you know, say hi. <laughs> yes, I do like it. I like it when people say hi. <laughs> you, yeah. can, you can benevolently stalk me. <laughs> yeah, Just don't okay. really stalk me. <laughs> yeah, don't really be, don't be outside the door. You know. Right. Yeah. Um, don't, I, I've, again, I've seen too many true crime documentaries. <laughs> I'm always watching. <laughs> yeah, no, it's way too close to home, I tell you. Um, wow, this has been a great conversation. Um, Thank you so much, Alan. This was fun. The, the book is called From Daylight to Madness, Hotel Number One, and our guest has been the author, which is Jennifer Ann Gordon, and I appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thank you so much. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.